The wedding in Cana is one of my favorite Bible stories. It shows a moment where God's grace breaks in and shines through human needs and restrictions. Jesus' sign of turning gallons of water into wine points to God's abandoned generosity, which can seem silly, crazy even, seen from human eyes. Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. The words of the chief steward say it all. Jesus turns the rules of the world upside down. Jesus' signs, especially this first one, can be difficult to grasp, hard to understand, and maybe that's not even the point. Maybe we are truly invited to enjoy the festivities, to lavish in God's goodness. How does the psalmist put it? They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights, for with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Now, some of you might think, how can we celebrate? How can we let go, let loose, and express joy and laughter when the pandemic is constantly looming over our heads? The climate challenge is still above above us, and world peace also seems way out of our grasp. Many sages will answer, without experiencing suffering, you will not be able to experience joy. Last month, on December 26, 2021, Archbishop Tutu from South Africa died. May he rest in peace. He was such a sage, a person who courageously faced many struggles. He changed the world for the better through his ministry of resistance, truth-telling, forgiveness, and yes, joy. Together with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Archbishop Tutu had just produced a movie, Mission Joy, Finding Happiness in Troubled Times. It is a documentary based on a conversation between the two, which was also captured in the Book of Joy, published in 2016. In it, Archbishop Tutu is cited as saying, If you are setting out to be joyful, you are not going to end up being joyful you're going to find yourself turned in on yourself. It is like a flower. You open, you blossom, really, because of other people. And I think some suffering, maybe even intense suffering, is a necessary ingredient for life, certainly for developing compassion. And he concludes, And in a kind of paradoxical way, it is how we face all of the things that seem to be negative in our lives that determines the kind of person we become. If we regard all of this as frustrating, we're going to come out squeezed and tight and just angry and wishing to smash everything. It seems that the true mark of happiness is be able to cultivate joy even when and just because the challenges are great. And a really important aspect of how we think about and relate to other people, that's a really important aspect of this. Tomorrow on January 17th, we remember not only Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but also the Desert Father of old, Anthony of Egypt. Abba Anthony lived from about 251 to 356 our time, and he is famous for being a recluse in the desert, but also for sharing his wisdom with those who came to hear. For Abba Anthony, humility was key to a good life. He said, reject pride and consider everyone more righteous than yourself. What a challenge. Instead of judging other people for what we think they do wrong, focusing on what they do right. Abba Anthony says, our life and our death is with our neighbor. If we gain our brother, we have gained God. But if we scandalize our brother, we have sinned against Christ. Humility and generosity 
are two important stepping stones on the path to joyous living. They open up our hearts to see and receive what is good about life. But then, of course, there still are all the bad news. How do we cope? We focus on what we can do to make the news better. We all make decisions every day to be kind or unkind, helpful or burdensome, sustainable or wasteful. We all make decisions as to who and what to spend our time with. Will we guide our hands to type yet another angry and hurtful comment on our favorite social media platform? Or will we write a card to somebody we haven't seen in a while? Pick up a hammer and help build a house with Habitat for Humanity. Thread a needle and make a quilt for Lutheran World Relief. A shawl for Sarge's place. A bee hotel for the pollinator pathway. Fold our hands in prayer. Hold the hand of a child. We have many choices as to how to spend our time. Some of you might already know that the interfaith community of Clallam County sponsors a community read every winter, starting end of January. One year, we read the Book of Joy by the Archbishop and the Dalai Lama, by the way. This year's read is quite hands-on. Paul Hawken wrote a book with a hopeful title, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. It is connected with a frequently updated website, regeneration.org. Book and website are full of holistic and inspirational information and suggestions as to how collective action by humanity can reduce greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2030. If you are interested in more information, check the January Trumpet and this week's MailChimp and Bulletin. All news is not bad news. But in today's media climate, we do have to make an effort to search for good news. I recently found the website karunavirus.org. Karuna is the Sanskrit word for compassion, and the goal of this website is to gather and spread good news every day. The founders believe that love trumps fear any time, and that good news is more contagious than even the coronavirus. They post links to good news from all over the world on their site so that everybody can easily access them. One of the articles I read was titled, Remember the Many Reasons to be Optimistic in 2022. Here's an excerpt. Despite the challenges of 2021, civilization has made impressive progress in rebounding after the pandemic and building a brighter future in 2022, says Freethink. The global economy has bottlenecks because supply chains are adapting to higher demand, not collapsing. Global trade volume is now higher than before the pandemic. Despite new COVID-19 waves, people and businesses have adapted behavior and technology, so restrictions have much less impact on gross domestic product than in the spring of 2020. And why the last 24 months may have felt like a setback in human progress? If we pan back to view the wider scope of data over the last 24 years, the trajectory is better and brighter than you might have expected. Life expectancy has grown, and poverty and global child mortality has decreased. Deaths from pollution decreased, and access to electricity increased globally. So now I know there are more aspects to all the things he mentioned here. And so bear with me, the situation is complex, but there are good news also to be found in the bad news. That's the point. God is at work in us, those around us, and those in faraway places. Sometimes the good news are not the first things we notice, but nevertheless, they're always there. It's a well-known practice to keep a gratitude journal and write down some of the things we're grateful for every day. Why not rename that journal a good news journal for a time? Let's focus on all the good news which come to us every day, every hour, every minute. All over the world, there are people who pick up hammers to build houses, 
thread needles to sew quilts. We are not in this alone. Nobody needs to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders all by themselves. Neighbor love is not a one-way street. It goes back and forth. Neighbors loving each other, helping each other, praying for each other, blessing each other in God's name. May God bless you as you bless others. Amen.